Eight o'clock on Friday. Here we go. Um, my name is John Evans. I'm with Ronstadt Professionals. Uh, I'm an accounting and finance recruiter, but more importantly, I am a board member of the Boys and Girls Club of Metropolitan Baltimore. Um, I will tell you, this has been honestly a truly special um, just endeavor. Um, it came together brilliantly and it's based on great people um, who sit on our board having unique talents and uh, I can't wait for you guys to hear um, from, you know, the three board members uh, who are our speakers. Um, this event has honestly brought a lot of joy to me and I'm, I'm just, I'm very uh, happy to be a part of it. I want to thank a couple people before we get started. Um, first off, Neil Constantoulis is from Click Solutions, cloud, cyber, um, you know, disaster recovery. Uh, he's going to put his uh, information into the chat. Um, he is our guy for Boys and Girls Club, his services. He sponsored the interpreters today uh, from Vital Signs. Um, you'll see them in the, I hope, in the box. <laughs> and um, I just, you know, I, I, I want to thank Neil and Click. Um, secondly, the team from Ronstadt, Angela Bray and her team, Catherine and Roberta, um, working hard to be the administrator, administrative uh, aspects of this and um, just coming through constantly. Angela and her team handle temporary placement. Um, and, you know, honestly, just a, a, a perfect representation of what Ronstadt is and how hard we work to staff and, you know, serve our, our candidates and clients. Um, my favorite board, one of my favorite boards, not, I mean, I have a lot of, I have uh, two really special boards, Boys and Girls Club of Metropolitan Baltimore and Financial Executives International. Financial Executives International, better known as FEI, is a makeup of great leaders, CEOs, CFOs. They were uh, a backbone of this event happening and, and advocating for this event to be special. Um, Denise Parker especially worked except, exceptionally hard to put this event together. And you'll see her as one of the administrators that is uh, doing the polling questions to make the CPE eligible. Denise, do you wanna say hi real quick and just kind of tell them how this is gonna go? Yeah, hey everybody. Um, I'll be launching a series of polling questions throughout the event. They'll just pop up on your screen. It's not mandatory that you respond unless you want CPE credit for this session. It's going to qualify for one and a half credits in the field of personnel HR. So if you do want the credits, you need to make sure to answer five out of the six polling questions. Thank you, Denise. And uh, FBI is a great member-based executive networking group that does events like this constantly and represents and, and shows off great businesses throughout the state of Maryland. Um, if you would ever like to be a part of, the, uh, of them, call me, email me. I'll, I'll get you lined up and to one of our events and talk to our board, board members and uh, you know, get, get you started. We're going to be hosting more events in July that I'll let you guys know about after this. Um, most importantly, I've been a board member of Boys and Girls Club of Metropolitan Baltimore for five years. Um, when I moved downtown, um, after working downtown for 16 years, I was brought to uh, the attention of, of this, this mission. And... Through, through honestly just becoming around the children in the areas of Baltimore that need it the most um, made me want to do this with the Boys and Girls Club, make this successful. And from the five years that I've been here, we are the absolute strongest and most, honestly, uh, I think caring, compassionate and loving nonprofit um, that wants to do great things for the city of Baltimore, as well as ex expand and give more kids an opportunity to receive not only education, additional education programming, and, um, you know, other uh, uh, athletics, um, you know, a, a safe place to go after school, a safe place to go during the summer, building relationships, it honestly is very special. So I'm very happy to introduce Jeff Breslin and Yolanda Birch, who I think are just two special people. Um, so I'll leave it to Jeff. Thanks, John. I appreciate you uh, setting this up. And thanks, everybody, for taking some time this morning. I'm going to be really brief because um, I'm excited to hear from our, our leaders. And I joined the team as CEO about 18 months ago and have had the pleasure of working with Ken, Jamila, and Nick and John on our board as we grow the organization. Right now, we have four clubs in Baltimore uh, looking to grow throughout the Baltimore region to provide um, that incredible opportunity for kids, um, not just after school, but during the summer. Um, you know, it's certainly an important time for us as a country, as we think about diversity, as we think about equity, and really it's at the core of who we are at Boys and Girls Clubs. And um, just last week, we hosted four conversations 
uh, with our full board and full staff that we call Designing Our Future. And it's really just the first of many, hopefully courageous conversations that we're gonna have as an organization to ultimately provide the type of opportunity that every single young person deserves in this city and in this country. And I mentioned, you know, those courageous conversations, it, it does take a lot of courage to have conversations about who we are as a people and who we are as a country. And I wanna um, pause here and introduce one of my partners at Boys and Girls Clubs, uh, one of our vice presidents who truly is a courageous leader and has been a leader in the space of youth development for um, many years now. And I'll let Ilonda Birch share a little bit about her journey. Good morning, everyone. I am super excited about our conversation. Um, I've been in youth development for about 25 years and I've worked for Boys and Girls Club for 20 years. And when John first talked about putting this together, I was really excited because oftentimes when we think about diversity, equity, and inclusion, we don't think about nonprofits. And so I'm just interested to listen and learn of how, as a nonprofit, we can be more intentional in, in having this be truly part of our core values as we move forward and continue to serve the young people in Baltimore. So thank you. So John, with that, we will uh, we'll turn it back to you. And again, Jamila, Ken, Nick, um, we often talk with our team and with our club members about the courage to share your own personal story and how valuable everybody's personal narrative and story is. So thanks for, uh, thanks for not only being on the board, but for sharing your story this morning. So John, thanks again for setting this up. This is, this is, uh, this is, um, I could listen to you guys all day. I honestly believe in it and I, I love what you're doing for the city. Um, okay. Real quick. We had 245 people register for this. I'm just going to tell you right now, I, this is the most successful event I've ever promoted and, and, and tried to help. Um, I think it's amazing. And it's all based around, I think we have three speakers who I can honestly personally tell you are the most genuine, compassionate, great friends and great people. So Ken, you know, Nick and Jamila, I just, I, I want to say thank you for, for, for doing this. And that brings me to my next um, professional that I, I absolutely love. Kimberly Davis, CAO of Versant Health. Um, she's an FEI board member as well. Um, Kim is going to be our moderator, and I can tell you she's honestly special and a wonderful human being as well. So, Kim, uh, I'll leave it to you. I am out for now. And just remember, if you ever need anything from us from a staffing and permanent placement hire, please reach out to Angela and, and I for help. And thank you so much. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. And thank you, John. Love you, too. Um, so, everyone, I'm really honored to be a part of this important, relevant, timely discussion today. Thank you to the Boys and Girls Club. Thank you to FEI and all of the sponsors that made this event possible. You know, when I think about 2020 so far, it, it's been a tough year for people of color, especially the African-American community. We've not only had the racial and inequalities highlighted by the recent instances of police brutality, which certainly is not a new issue, but is now getting the attention that it deserves, but we've also had the impact of COVID-19, which has just been devastating to communities of color and has brought to the forefront the disparity in access to care in minority communities. So just a really tough year, which again, makes this uh, conversation so important this morning. And I think it's testimony that we have a record number of attendees here um, because it is such a relevant topic. You know, I think in the past, corporations have been reluctant and um, to comment or to, to be vocal about social issues. They've largely stayed silent, but I think now it's no longer acceptable to stay silent, right? Silence from corporations now is viewed as acceptance or complacency. So we're seeing more and more corporations issuing formal statements, um, in some cases making material financial contributions to organizations that are leading the movement to bring about racial equality. You know, it, it's a fact that most corporations are not in a position to directly solve social issues like police brutality, but what they can do is ensure that there is equality within their own organizations. So I think about companies like Versant Health, like Under Armour, Grant Thornton, Stanley Black & Decker. You know, these organizations have long recognized the importance of diversity and inclusion. And we're very fortunate this morning to have leaders here today from those organizations to speak to us about their journeys and also give us some tactical advice on how to develop or improve the diversity, equity, and inclusion programs in our own organizations. So with that, without any further delay, I am excited to introduce our first speaker, Nick Tatum. 
Nick began his career at PricewaterhouseCoopers and is now the North America controller for Under Armour's largest segment, which generates over $4 billion in revenue. He successfully moved up the ranks at Under Armour, um, serving as senior manager of financial reporting and technical accounting, and also senior manager of corporate accounting. He is also the leader of Under Armour's diversity and equity and inclusion team. Nick is gonna walk us through his personal diversity journey and talk to us about what it means to be a leader in Under Armour's DE&I team. So Nick, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you for the, the great introductions, John and Kim. Thank you for this great event. And um, thank you everybody for being up early on a Friday morning. Um, you know, I know during the pandemic time um, has kind of become meaningless, but uh, you know, I really appreciate everybody getting up early to talk about this topic. Um, and it's, it's a really, really, really important topic to me, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, it's been one of the cornerstones of my careers in public accounting. Um, and it's really meant so much to me um, as a beneficiary of great diversity programs, but as well as an emerging leader in, in the industry. So I um, wanted to spend a little time with you today to just talk through my diversity journey, um, what it's meant to me, um, where I am on that journey, and, and where I hope to go. Um, so my journey kind of started uh, back in 2005. Um, so as you guys just saw in the polling question, the AICPA did a study uh, in 2004, and they wanted to know um, how many CPAs were African American. Um, and based on the results of the poll, only 3% of CPAs at the time were black. And at the time in the country, black people represented about 15% of the population. So the industry and the firms were, were well aware that this was an issue. And they had a really good understanding that diversity isn't only a, a moral imperative, but it's also a value proposition. Um, there's, a, there's an article in the Harvest, uh, Harvard Business Review um, by Lorenzo and Rees that talks about how diversity drives innovation and financial performance. So because this is such an issue and because of what's waiting on the other side of these uh, well thought out diversity programs, the firms and the industry took notice and they, and they looked for ways to start to solve that issue. Um, so back in 2005, um, I got scholarships from the AICPA and PwC. Um, and these scholarships were diversity scholarships. They, these were the start of trying to, to navigate and fight that issue of diversity uh, in the CPA field. Um, but not only were, were these scholarships, but they also afforded me to go to three-day symposiums where I was surrounded by a diverse group of aspiring CPAs. And I began to learn about the science and the study of diversity. Um, and really began to learn that diversity isn't just taking a group of people and throwing them together. Diversity is a well thought out, well curated plan to drive and have different points of view in the room, in organizations to make them better. And ultimately make society better. Um, so this really kind of kickstarted me to not only think about diversity as a, as a black man in this country and, and why I didn't see representation of black people, especially black men in, in boardrooms, um, it, it helped me to begin to think even beyond that and, and helped me to begin to think, you know, what, what other gaps are there? What other gaps do I have as a person who one day wants to be a leader? Um, so this is when I really started to, to think about what diversity means. Um, and during my time at PwC, um, the firm invested in a, lot in, a lot in me as an emerging um, diverse leader. Um, I went to diversity trainings. I had sponsorship from, from different partners in the organization. And I really began to learn that you have to pour into diverse talent. And I didn't know the term. Um, I didn't know what I was experiencing was the equity part of, of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And a lot of times we kind of lose sight of, of equity and inclusion when we talk about diversity. But without equity, you know, diversity programs are kind of like a garden that you plant and don't water. You have to give the, the different diverse talent 
um, different forms of equity. So PwC demonstrated to, to that to me uh, early on in my career by, by pouring in me and helping me become the leader, fill some of the gaps that I had, and really just develop and emerge, um, which really helped me build a career. So that's one of the reasons I'm, I'm forever grateful to PwC and for starting my career there. Um, and it kind of got, that, that's where I kind of got the bug to just learn more about diversity and learn about um, the different types of programs. Um, you know, as I fast forward my career to, to joining Under Armour, um, I began to, uh, when I got to Under Armour, I was, I was in middle management. So I was, I was directly responsible for hiring people, leading teams, and really impacting the organization. So a lot of the diversity training that I've had over the years has really prepared me for this moment. You know, how do you lead diverse, high-performing teams? How do you get the most out of your teams, even though they're very different and come from all different types of walks of life? Um, so I got to really flex and develop some of my tools, continue to study and focus on diversity. And at the time, uh, diversity was important to the company, but it was becoming increasingly important. So about four years ago, the, the company developed culture clubs at the time is what we called them. Um, and, and these culture clubs, you know, if I can be completely transparent, um, I, didn't, I didn't think they would last. I, I thought they would come around, you know, we would do a couple happy hours, you know, maybe do a couple presentations a year and they would fizzle out and we would go back to, to business as usual. But, um, I'm really, really happy that I was really, really wrong because these culture clubs have ultimately changed the the company in, a, in an extremely meaningful way. Um, the culture clubs evolved into what you know we talk a lot about today and employee resource groups, but at Under Armour we're all teammates, so we call them teammate resource groups. So I am the I'm one of the co-chairs of UAB. UAB stands for Black Employees Achieving Together. And it's a, it's a culture club that focuses on our Black employees. Um, and, and we're developed to focus on uh, what we call the 4C model. So we focus on culture, commerce, career, and community. So, you know, I've had the ability to go from someone who's benefited greatly from firms and companies pouring in me as a diverse leader to have an opportunity to continue to be poured into, but to also kind of give back and help my other teammates in, in, in the areas we just talked about. But not only am I helping my teammates, I'm also helping the company. Um, as Kim mentioned, it's extremely important for companies to expose their values and, and consumers want more than a product. They want to know what you stand for. So in, our, in my role, I, I not only get to kind of help develop events for our teammates that focus on career, um, focus on our community in Baltimore. I grew up in Baltimore. So every time I get to do an event that helps uh, an organization in Baltimore, like the Boys and Girls Club, um, it just brightens my day and, and, and engages me more in, in what I do every day. Um, but, you know, what's really important to the company is that the commerce see that we really focus on how do we show up? How do we show up externally? How do we make sure our voices are heard? How do we make sure that for a company that hires thousands of black employees and supports dozens of, of black athletes and has you know, millions of black consumers, how do we make sure we're showing up the right way? Um, and, and as you can imagine, being a leader of, of a teammate resource group for black teammates over the past three weeks in this country, it's been honestly the, the hardest, but most meaningful job I've ever had. Um, you know, right now in the country, we're at this inflection point where we can and will change for the better. And as a diversity leader, I get to play a part in that in a way other than what I would do with my own social activism or, or giving. It's another lane for me to, to be a part of that journey. Um, so, you know, this is kind of where I am on my diversity journey now. Um, I'm, I'm learning a lot. I continue to learn every day. 
um, you know, as, as, a, as an accountant, as a CPA, I'm really technical. So I really like to, to understand technically what diversity means and, um, you know, learn the terminology and, and really understanding because there's a lot of people that study this and it's really well, well thought out. So, you know, although I, I'm on this diversity journey and, and I'm a minority by race, you know, I still recognize that I have privilege. You know, I'm a cisgender, heterosexual Christian male in the United States. So in a lot of ways, I have a lot of privilege outside of, of being an African-American male. Um, and I need to constantly learn and think about, you know, how does that privilege impact my life and my teams, coworkers, teammates um, all around me? And, and how do I play a part? Um, and I also just enjoy learning and, and studying, um, you know, things like what it means to, you know, what's a person's intersectionality and, you know, how does the different groups they fit in, you know, drive who they are as a person. Um, also, just learning things like, you know, words that we use every day are, are, are ableist slurs and really just educating myself on how to be a, a better diversity leader. So. Um, in closing, you know, as I've gone along my journey, the, the one thing I'll share is that there's three things to really focus on as, you know, as you all go on your own journeys, and that's to just be curious, be empathetic, be empathetic, and be courageous. Um, and Kim, I'll pass it back over to you. Wow. Thank you, Nick. That, that was amazing. Um, a, a lot to unpack there, but... You know, I think Nick is a prime example of what I was saying earlier about the roles that organize, organizations can play in helping to heal this country of some of these social injustices, right? There's a lot that we can do within our organizations, and then it just spreads out into the community. So thank you, Nick, for sharing your story. Uh, next, we have Ken Sway. Ken began his career at PwC. He held various finance leadership roles at Stanley Black & Decker during his 14 years there. While at Stanley Black & Decker, Ken led the corporation's first Asian employee resource group from inception and then growing it to three locations across the US. Leveraging that experience, he's spoken at various global events, educating employees on the topic of diversity and inclusion. Ken has an MBA from the University of Hartford and dual degrees from the College of New Jersey in accountancy and industrial organizational psychology. So welcome, Ken, thank you. All right. Thanks a lot, Kim. Um, you know, as this as, as we tabulate the results, I'm expecting a lot of highs and mediums here, especially due to all the racial equality issues that are going on right now. Um, so as as we see that, I just had a quick tangent for Asian heritage. Uh, I've been trying to practice Mandarin ever since the social distancing started. So I try to do that every morning. I could always speak and understand a bit, but you know, in the past three months, I'm proud to say that now I can read and write a bit. And it, it only took a pandemic for me to do something my parents have been begging me to do my entire life. So you're welcome. All right, so it looks like we came in pretty close to what the expectation was. You know, some, some lows, some leaders don't really talk about it. So let's see how we can move that needle. So like Kim said, uh, uh, I'm Ken Sway, and I led the first Asian employee resource group at Stanley Black & Decker from the inception. We call them ERGs. Um, so let's go over the agenda. I'm gonna discuss why d &I culture is important, the best practices to create that type of culture at your organization, and some d &I experiences I've had out in the workplace and the community. So why is it important for your for your organization. The first is business results, and Nick kind of mentioned this. There was a McKinsey study following 180 companies globally, noting that profits were 14% higher for those with the most diverse boards versus those with the least diverse boards. And I must note that I'm proud that our Boys and Girls Club board is made up of more than 50% minorities and were led by a female chair. So shout out to Jessica Gappa, who I saw joined great leader. So with this strong diversity and, culture, uh, diversity and inclusion culture, you're going to attract a lot of different minorities to come to your company, and that's going to boost your organizational cognitive diversity and innovation. Also, what Nick had said earlier, 
you know, your employees are going to start attacking issues and solutions from different perspectives. And, you know, hom homogenous workforce may not have thought of those different strategies. Their perspective also may provide you different products and services that will help you create some niche markets and, and drive up your sales. So one example, there's an entrepreneur named Tristan Walker who started Bevel, which is a subscription service for razors, predominantly focused on people with very curly hair. So a lot of black men and women. He was turned down by tons of venture capitalists. They, they just couldn't see how it was a great idea. And as you may know, venture capital has been an industry notorious for its lack of diversity. So today, Tristan has the distinction of being Procter & Gamble's first black CEO within their company. How? Well, P&G acquired his company. And he, like Nick, does you know, a ton giving back to minorities in the community nowadays. Okay, great, Ken. I get it. You know, what steps can I put into place to take advantage of all these benefits? So I've got four solutions of my own, some from BCG and McKinsey Insights. So number one, ensure a quality of opportunity through transparency. If minorities only make up 10% of your workforce, you know, embrace that, take credit for knowing it, and announce it with what your goal is going to be. It should be part of your strategic plan, just like any other major business goal is. You know, number two, ensure a quality of opportunity through fairness. Do you think that your promotion and compensation policies are unbiased? Yeah, you, you probably do. Um, and, and you don't want it to be unbiased, of course. Well, BCG research says that almost all companies actually have DNI programs in place, but only a quarter of employees in diverse groups feel like they've personally benefited. So what's the gap there? So I think that you should analyze promotions, your, your raise policies and other policies with you know, race and gender in mind so that you're not satisfied until the data evidences that they are fair. Three, ensure your business leaders know that it's not just an HR or an ERG leader responsibility for creating this culture. You know, We've got business presidents and CFOs on this call. You're, you're so important to making sure that this culture is successful versus a failure at your organization. And lastly, or sorry, four, ensure diverse talent is represented throughout your organization. Set specific hiring goals. And, but not only that, back them up with work policies that support them. So. Adidas increased their females as a percent of management from 21 to 30% in three years. They didn't just set the hiring metrics. They also provided things like childcare assistance and flexible work schedules. And lastly, you're going you're gonna to hear a lot of excuses. So, hey, we, we don't get enough minority candidates that are quality or we've got to fill the position now. So these are just kind of indications that there might be something wrong in your processes, whether it's that you need to plan succession, you, you need to have succession planning earlier and be prepared for it. Uh, or maybe your company right now is just not as enticing for minority candidates. You wanna look into that. So we could talk about many more solutions for hours and I'm glad Nick spoke about equity because that's super important. So we're going to send out some additional reading for you to dive into on your own. And I'm happy to answer questions after the event's over. So diversity and inclusion uh, has made me feel like I'm part of a, a larger community that I can really understand better and can impact in many different ways. So at our Asian Heritage Network, it started with 10 employees, grew to over 500 followers, uh, worldwide uh, uh, employees, and we were interacting with people in Thailand, people in India, people in the Philippines, and it just made the, the whole company seem like a smaller place. My experience with other ERGs was just as impactful. I went to a Veterans Network event, went to this nonprofit called Catch a Lift in Towson. So they provide free gym equipment to veterans, and we were there to just call on the people who received their equipment and take down some data. So one of the conversations was like this. Hey, Gloria, 
Uh, notice that you got your rowing equipment about six months ago. Uh, how many hours of sleep did you get prior to receiving that equipment? Oh, I'd probably say around like oh, an hour and a half, two hours a night. An hour and a half or two hours a night? Okay, so you know, now that you've been using your rowing equipment, how many hours are you getting today? Oh, it's probably increased. Last night I got about five, six hours. Oh, wow, that's great. It sounds like it's a great impact. You know, it's been really helpful. How about the number of medicines you used prior to uh, receiving your rowing machine? Uh, I think it was probably 12 or 13. 12 or 13 a day? I'm really sorry to hear that. Uh, how, how about now that you've been using your rowing machine? Uh, it's, you know, today I, I probably took eight. Okay, so something, some conversation that simple shows how important it is for us to support our veterans. And I've also seen a lot while in our boys and girls clubs too. So Toyota every week sends, sends volunteers to work specifically with our teens and I was fortunate to join them while we were looking at resumes and improving because the teens wanted to get jobs. I actually helped someone set up a work permit and, and set it up on, online. I've never done that before. We both learned something. My friend Julia, who works at Under Armour in their abilities resource group that Nick was mentioning earlier, her, her group set up an entire well, a holistic wellness program that's gonna expose our kids to yoga, to nutrition, to mental health, amazing. We have a karate teacher that goes to our Brooklyn club every week, teaches martial arts to our kids. And then I'll finish with uh, you know, my own impactful story. Three years ago, I was at O'Donnell Heights at our summer camp. And at reading time, one girl just said, I, I hate reading. I said, I was like, why? You can, you can learn so much, you can experience different things, you can go off to a far place. Reading's great, reading's fun. She said, okay, okay, Mr. Ken, goes and grabs a book, comes back and says, I'm gonna read a page and you're gonna read a page and we'll alternate. Okay, so we did that for the next two minutes. And I think a lot of parents out there have the same experience where for the next 10 minutes, I didn't read a page at all. So she finishes the chapter, runs over to the unit director, explains it to him and he stops everybody, silences everyone. And Kanaya stands up straight and exuberantly presents on that chapter she read. So when the, when the final applause died down, she plopped down right next to me and she had this smile that showed just pride and satisfaction. And I'll never forget that. So, you know, a child might say they hate reading, but it might be because they're just not getting the support or it's a weakness or, uh, you know, a multitude of other things. So we can all make that happen for them. So in conclusion, at the end of the day, everyone from top to bottom in the organization, the community has a hand in creating that culture. Everyone should feel empowered to learn, ask questions, take initiative and make an impact. With all the civil unrest currently and people still social distancing, we've got some time. There's a lot of resources we can mine online or in, the, in books. Let's take advantage of that and expand our understanding of each other so we can really make our organizations and the world a more inclusive, happier, and productive place. Thank you very much. Back to you, Kim. Thank you, Ken, so much. Your passion is really coming through the computer this morning. Really appreciate that. Lots of good tactical advice there that we can take back to our organizations. Uh, so next, it's my pleasure to introduce Jamila Webb. She is an audit partner at Grant Thornton, specializing in assurance and advisory services to the federal government. In addition to being a CPA, she is a certified information systems auditor and a certified government financial manager. Jamila is the executive sponsor of Grant's African American Business Resource Group, AABRG. This morning, Jamila is going to talk to us about Grant Thornton's DNI program the role that DNI plays in recruiting and retaining diverse talent, and she'll also share her personal journey as a, both a woman and an African American. Good morning, Jamila. Good morning, Kim. Thank you. Um, I will start off by saying that both Ken and Nick are going to be tough acts to follow. And I, Ken, I just love that story that you shared about your involvement with the kids at the Boys and Girls Club. I think many of us on the board aspire to be like Ken. Um, 
and just develop that personal connection with um, members of the club. So um, I think it's just a real testament of how being intentionally involved in a, a child's life um, can have so much great impact. Um, so as Kim mentioned, I did want to give an overview of Grant Thornton's Office of Diversity and Inclusion. Um, it, it, the office, I think, was really born out of gender diversity issues several years ago, and that's our most I would say mature focus area is focusing on uh, the lack of women in the accounting profession. And I think um, one of the polling questions you'll see is going to tie into the lack of still gender diversity in the accounting and finance profession. Um, so our diversity and inclusion office is embedded within the talent arm of our strategic, the firm's strategic framework where we say our commitment is to source, hire, and retain the best diverse talent and embrace diversity and inclusion. Um, that office report, the director of that office reports to our national managing partner of what we call people and culture, which is essentially our human resources group. Um, so what Grant Thornton tries to do is integrate inclusive diversity across the firm, including recruitment and retention, um, how we develop and promote our talent, and how we go to market, how we drive sales and business development. Um, so that's more like the HR side of our Office of Diversity and Inclusion, but Grant Thornton also has what we call business resource groups. Um, you've heard um, different acronyms for them from Ken and Nick, but essentially the same concept. We call them BRGs um, and the firm is now up to nine of those with our newest ones being future leaders and allies and um, drawing a blank on the second newest one, it'll come to me for oh, working parents and allies, um, which has really stepped up, especially in the age of COVID. You can imagine, especially those on the line with young kids at home, how challenging it's been to be a working parent, um, you know, at home with your kids all day and still needing to be productive. Um, so again, the firm has nine BRGs, um, and I, I do want to kind of tell you about all of them. I am the executive, national executive sponsor of the African American and Allies Business Resource Group. I'll, I'll call it AABRG from now on going forward. Um, and I serve along with seven other national executive sponsors. So those are essentially partners, principals, and managing directors across the firm. Um, of the seven, three are allies, so non-Black and African-American, and the remaining four are um, African-American partners in the firm. We are also supported by um, what we call a diversity champion, and she sits on our national leadership team, which is a small group of 10 senior partners, less than 10 senior partners. So she's, um, you know, she advises us as a BRG executive leadership team, and she also serves as kind of a, a direct tie into our national leadership team, although we do have the ability to reach out to them di directly, but she kind of champions our efforts and, and, and is our cheerleader for the issues that we, we want to put forward. So jumping back, um, the firm's other BRGs um, are Diverse Abilities and Allies, Equality GT, uh, which focuses on the LGBTQ community, future leaders and allies, as I mentioned, AABRG, Hispanics and Latinx, Pan-Asians and allies, women and allies, which is our oldest, um, most mature BRG, working parents and allies, and veterans and allies. Um, so oftentimes our BR BRGs will co-host events and, and um, you know, help support each other Especially, I've seen that um, you know a lot of partnership with the AABRG specifically over the last few weeks. I've been proud to see um, you know statements issued by the firm's other BRGs in support of the AABRG at this time. Um, and just yesterday, we had um, a, 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 a meeting between the um, I'm sorry, a meeting sponsored by the Veterans and Allies BRG, where um, they committed a, a large amount of their time um, talking about issues facing the African-American community right now. Um, 
so in terms of the AABRG structure, I am really proud of the fact that it's one employee led, but most of those employees that serve in leader roles, I would say are mostly young professionals, um, some even straight out of college and they've stepped up to take on regional roles in, 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 uh, in leading the, the BRG and they really do lead. Um, they get advice and support from us as the national executive sponsors, but they are the ones that are, you know, um, rallying up resources, coming up with ideas um, to pitch to the national executive sponsors. Um, and, you know, we just kind of sponsor and help support them wherever we can. So I've been really proud to um, join calls with the team over the last few weeks and just listen to the ideas that they've put out. Um, one of the biggest programming that programs that is um, put out by the AR, AABRG is what we call Fearless Conversations, which is exactly what it sounds like. Um, we engage in a dialogue um, on a specific topic. And the idea is to have a candid conversation about a number of issues, but most surrounding diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, and more lately, um, specific to racial injustice. Um, so recently, you know, yesterday we had the Veterans and Allies um, BRG call and it opened up with a fearless conversation. Many of our executive meetings open up with fearless conversations. You know, some may be just one person speaking for about five minutes about a personal issue, um, but more often they are, um, you know, panel led, maybe a, a conversation like this, but really trying to have open, candid conversation about issues that um, are affecting the community. Um, Let's see, Kim mentioned that I grew up in Baltimore and I, I grew up not only in Baltimore, but I grew up in inner city Baltimore. So one of the things that I'm just really passionate about is I sit and serve as a, an executive sponsor on the AABRG is how can we not only um, support diverse talent recruitment, but what I'm seeing, um, you know, as I've been in public accounting for over 20 years is that we don't necessarily do a good job of retaining that diverse talent. You know, I started my career in 98 at Ernst & Young, and I just remember how isolating it was going from inner city Baltimore, you know, primarily black experience my entire life to being the only African American in the room and how you know awkward that could have been or that was at times and um, it leads to a feeling of not being included. Um, you can probably hear me getting a little emotional about it now, but that's I think the reason that a lot of people don't stay in our industry. So I'm really passionate about being intentional about reaching out to young talent, um, letting them know they have a voice and trying to develop those common relationships. So I think as we get into this conversation a little bit more, um, you know, we'll talk a little bit more about talent recruitment and retention, but uh, that's where I spend a lot of my time working with the BRG and with our people and culture team on talent issues. So with that, Kim, I will turn it back to you. Wow, that was powerful, Jamila. And I, of course, can certainly relate to your, your story and that feeling of being the only in the room. So thank you so much for sharing that, that with us. Wow, so where to begin to wrap this up? A lot of good information shared here and a lot of really thought-provoking insights. I think that we'll all take away probably something different from this discussion this morning. But you know, for me personally, when I think back you know, about the three speakers, a few things kind of stood out to me. So you know, with Nick, it was, you know, that the comment that without equity, um, you know, it, diversity is like a garden you plant and then don't water, right? So it's not enough for organizations to go out and say, oh, I have, I have this great diversity and inclusion program. Oh, you know, look what we've done. Um, you know, well, what do you do after that, right? How do you foster and, and feed and fertilize the talent that you, that the, the diverse talent that you brought in? So I think that was very important. And just sort of mind blowing this concept 
of you know an African American man saying that he has privilege. And I think I'll be thinking about that for a long time, and that certainly resonates with me. And as I sit here and just think about my position and, and where I am, and you know how that might also be impacting how I'm viewing things as well. So so thank you so much, Nick, for those. Um, and Ken, you know I, I talked a lot about your comment about measuring our DNI program. So again, going back to you, you know, organizations have these programs, but how are we measuring them? Does the data actually show that the programs you put in place are benefiting the people that you intended them to benefit? I think that's so important. And then also your comment about challenging the excuses that we make when we're going out and recruiting talent. You know, oh, it's going to take more time. They, you know, they're not applying. All the different things we've all heard them. And you know, just challenging ourselves to, to kind of not let those excuses stand in our way. Um, so thank you, Ken, for those insights. And then Jamila, certainly, again, your comment about being the only, I can certainly relate to that and appreciate the efforts that you're doing to kind of go reach back now to those that are coming along so that maybe they don't have to feel some of the isolation that we felt as we began our journey. So really good stuff here. Um, we do have time this morning for some Q&A. Um, some comments, some questions have come in through the chat. Feel free to go ahead now and add questions to the chat if you have not done so already. Um, but a couple that have come in already, I'll start with this one. Um, can you share specific examples of ways to promote equity? And that was directed sp specifically to you, Nick. Oh, you're on mute. Nick, you're on mute. Sorry about that. Um, so when I think about equity, I'm really thinking about filling gaps and every group has different gaps that they need to fill and every everybody like all of our different diverse groups has something that they need to kind of catch those groups up to the other groups that have you know there's different privileges um so you know the one the one example i kind of gave in the chat was you know companies can focus on things like if women are constantly underpaid spend resources and spend money on salary studies and then spend money on right sizing those salaries you know, that, that's equity. And there may be some men that are underpaid or there may be some other groups, but if it's really an issue and a focus for women, pour into those resources. So not only will you be a leader in that field, but every woman who deals with the, you know, the reality their entire life of making 80, 90 cent on the dollar for every man, they'll be extremely, you know, grateful to the company and engaged in that company who's helping right and the wrongs. Um, and on top of all of that, it's just ethically and morally the right thing to do. So I just kind of think about equity as, as filling the gaps and filling the buckets. Great. Thanks, Nick. And I'll actually open that up to you, Jamila, Ken, if you wanted to add to that, um, you know, specific examples of, of ways to promote equity. You know, I'll just say that I, I think, um, Nick's answer was spot on. I, I do sincerely believe in the power of mentorship and helping um, to reach back and, 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 and look for those resources that may, you know, be, you know, great talent that you're just kind of missing out on because maybe they don't look like you or maybe they're not as outspoken and they're not getting themselves seen, but still great talent. Um, I think that helps drive equity, the, you know, the the more you broaden the pot and diversify the people that you have in your organization, I think will also contribute to equity and giving them a voice. Yeah, and I would say that on an overall basis, um, it might be that leaders model the right behaviors. So uh, if we have ERG events, a lot of our employees wouldn't go because they said, well, my, my boss is sitting in his office. He doesn't, he doesn't even know what an ERG is. So if, if leaders are aware and they not only go to those events, but they, they tell their teams, hey, let's, let's go to this Asian network event or let's go to this uh, you know, other ERG event. That's really powerful and shows the employees that there's a culture and not just you know, something here for a certain number of, number of employees. It's for everybody and everybody can learn from that. Thank you, thank you guys. Another really great question just came into the chat. How do you respond to the non-diverse people in an organization that want to fight back on the diversity goals of the company? So really good question. So Ken, Jamila, Nick, any of you want to take that one? 
I, I guess what I would say is I remember, um, I remember actually a, a speaking engagement that Kim, that you were, uh, that you did last year about women in the, in, in business. And you said while you were, uh, se- while you were setting up your new team, you, you set these guidelines, you wanted people that made an impact. You wanted people that wanted change. And then people self-selected themselves out of the company. And then you were able to replace those people with, with people who embrace that new culture. So I would say you kind of do the same thing here. If, if this is really important to you, you're building that, that, this great culture. People who aren't for that culture, people who don't want to learn about other people, they're just going to self-select themselves out of the company. You're going to have this natural selection environment. Um, and then you're going to build this great culture for the, for the employees and for the organization. I feel like we're experiencing such momentum right now where, you know, I just had a call with our firm CEO yesterday where he wanted to reinforce his commitment and he acknowledged his privilege, his white privilege. And, um, and quite frankly, some of the ignorance um, that he had and, and just was really honest about how he's opening up and, and realizing um, that the impacts of the systemic racial injustice that is still impacting even successful African-American um, members of our community, such as myself, you, Kim, and Nick, I'm sure, um, still to this day. So um, I think that we have to take advantage of these conversations that are happening right now. I think it's an opportunity that if voices like that are coming up, we um, as a whole have an opportunity to move them out of our organizations and not affiliate ourselves with them. Um, I just really think that we have to be active on it. We can't just let it fester and let that be the sentiment that we um, associate ourselves with anymore. Yeah, and and I agree, um, Ken, Jamila, spot on with the responses. Um, The only thing I'll add is that at this point where we are in the history of the world, and, and at this specific moment that, that we're at, if you still kind of question from a moral ethical standpoint, the importance of diversity, um, you know, I would just appeal to the fact that it does drive performance and it is important for business. So, you know, uh, a r- really smart people have told me sometimes you can't change the hearts and minds of people. And, and if you continue trying to do that with people that you have to work with, you, you may just fail. So sometimes you do, just need to get people on board with the fact that this is going to drive us forward. It's going to drive innovation. It's going to drive performance. So if for nothing else, it needs to be done for that way. Um, But at the same time, trying to pull them in and educate um, and also just trying to make sure people are aware and responsible and aware of the responsibility for their own education. You know, it's not always on the minority group or the oppressed group to constantly educate. Um, just kind of give that reminder, like, you know, if, if you don't understand the importance of this, you have some education you need to do. Yep, I agree 100%. Um, another question, good question is coming in, and Ken, I'll direct this one to you because you're, you're mentioned here, and then um, Jamila and Nick, feel free to weigh in. But the question is, how do you make sure that all of the ERG and BRG groups in an organization aren't siloed? In a weird way, can't they sort of become segregated For example, the Asian networking events Ken mentioned. And I think this is a very good question. This used to come up when um, we were starting various women groups and organizations. And I heard a lot from women sometimes, well, you know, are we going to start to segregate ourselves and set ourselves apart um, versus integrating ourselves? So Ken, can you talk a little bit about um, your thoughts on that? Yes. So yeah, great question. And and we actually, while we we were building our Asian network and other ERGs, we had some concerns about that. We would talk about it. And you know, what I would say is that that's the, that's the reason why allies are so important. And you're just having an interest in others and learning about your fellow employee or your fellow community member. I mean, if you think about it that way, it's not very segregating. What we tried to do in our network was, so our mission was to encourage culture, connection, and development by embracing Asian heritage. So it didn't mean you had to be Asian. We had several allies on our teams who 
pushing out, you know, different cultural information for everyone to enjoy. And at the end of the day, we actually were, were spotted to see, we, we were happy to see all these different people who weren't Asians coming to our events, you know, trying different teas and snacks from India that we provided, throwing uh, or playing cricket, watching a traditional Indian dance and, and really enjoying those things, you know, learning about why other people really, uh, really love the, the holiday Diwali, what it means to them and how similar it is in some respects to our New Year's celebration. So I think having an open mind, you know, like, Jim, like Nick has been saying, is really important. Yeah. yeah, and the thing I'll, I'll add to that, Ken, is that like employee resource groups are not solely for the group that's, that has their name on the banner. Employee resource groups are for those people, but they're also for people that touch that group through the concept of intersectionality. And they're also, like Kim mentioned, for allies. Um, so these groups, you know, our, our group beat, it's not just about black employees coming together. It's about the black experience and the, the diaspora and teaching all of our allies and peers and friends about that. So, you know, the goal of the groups is to have everybody kind of come in the fold. And our focus at Under Armour specifically this year is really focusing on that allyship because, you know, I'm black and I've been black my whole life as well as my, you know, core beat members. Our biggest goal is to try to embrace other people and make sure they know that, you know, I go to events for our women's group, for our, our LGBTQ group, like they're, they're not, there is a way they could be set up where they will be these silos and segregation, but it has to be a focus on these groups are for everyone and you should join and go to as many events as possible for all the different groups. Yeah. And Kim, I'll just say briefly, I'm um, just echoing what Ken and Nick have already said. If you, the allyship is important and it's key to that. If you notice, um, when I listed the names of our BRGs, they all end with and allies. So not only, um, you know, are the allies at the employee level, I think is really important too, that each has an executive sponsor that is not a direct member of that BRG. So I mentioned that the AABRG, for instance, has three um, uh, non-Black, executive sponsors. And I think the support at the top of the organization also drives um, the fact that this is important to the firm as a whole. Um, so I don't have a fear of it um, creating this potential for segregation. Great, thanks for that. So the next question we have is um, directed at you, Jamila. Um, and it reads, here at FTI, we have a groundswell of enthusiasm and motivation to take action to support our black and brown communities and employees. What are some of the things that Grant Thornton is doing to take action now and not lose steam, as well as what actions are really sustainable? Well, that was my fear. Um, so I think three or uh, four weeks ago, right after George Floyd's um, murder, my um, managing partner called on me to host the one of those fearless conversations I talked about. And he was really intentional about, um, you know, listening more than talking and letting me do some of the talking. Um, I'm sorry, most of the talking to lead that conversation. Um, but out of that conversation, the emails of ideas and support from every person in the firm, they were just pouring in and it was um, overwhelming, but overwhelming in a good way. So we just rallied around that as an executive sponsor group, um, we were really methodical about collecting those ideas um, and trying to figure out what we could put in place quickly. So, you know, people knew that we were taking action on it and what were gonna be longer term goals. So, you know, just top of mind, some of the things, some of the ideas that have come in that we're taking action on um, and, and some are gonna be pretty immediate actions are um, help are joining within an organization to help get out the vote um, we are looking to make a huge impact by supporting um, an organization, a nonprofit organization, to your point, Yolanda, focused on uh, racial injustice and inequity, something that impacts the, um, the African American community directly. So we're doing that um, on a large scale, but also on a smaller scale to what we call um, startup nonprofits. So um, 
the firm calls them purple paladins. Purple is Grant Thornton's um, color. Um, so we're so it would be supporting an organization like ACLU, for instance, but also um, supporting, um, you know, a startup organization. So like maybe a nonprofit that just popped up to support people impacted by COVID. Um, so those are some of the immediate initiatives that I'm seeing. But um, yeah, I think it was really important to not lose sight of all of those ideas that were coming in and, and being able to effectively track those and make sure they were being properly vetted um, and making sure that people felt like they, their ideas were being heard and not just ignored and we weren't just giving lip service to an idea um, that we were gonna forget about in a week or two. Yeah, I think that's important, right? That we don't lose the momentum that, that we have going here. So thank you for that. Um, the next question is a really good one. I think it's probably a question that a lot of people have is, um, it says, it seems like a hard discussion to start with your firm. Any recommendations on how to get started? So, <laughs> what do you guys think? You just have to start it. I hear from a lot of my white male partners that, you know, I'm sorry I didn't say anything, but I just don't know what to say. And I can tell their hearts are in the right place. Um, but I think you just have to get the conversation started. We're all gonna fumble. Um, Nick, Ken, and I aren't going to know the, the right thing to say all the time just because we are in a minority position. But I think getting the conversation started is most important. What I was hearing from a lot of those young professionals that I mentioned earlier is they went to work that Monday morning after George Floyd and they were hurt and offended that it was just business as usual there were team meetings being conducted with no recognition of the fact that they may be experiencing some PTSD, some trauma, um, because they can personally relate to that story. So you just have to acknowledge it. It's not going to be comfortable, but it's a way to get us started. Yeah, no, I completely agree with that. Um, you know, I, I think the first step is to educate yourself. So, you know, take responsibility for your knowledge gaps and on this topic the same way you would um, as, as, as a topic as a professional, as a finance or accounting or, or legal professional. Take, you know, take that responsibility and, and educate yourself. And then once you have a basis, you know, Jamel is right, you're, you're not going to nail it every time, but just get, get, get uncomfortable. Like, get uncomfortable. Um, whatever group you're talking to, is a lot more uncomfortable in their life or in the experience than you are, especially if you're coming from a position of power. So just spend a few minutes getting uncomfortable, having those conversations, you know, and be okay not knowing the answer or they're not being the answer, just having a dialogue where you're there to listen and show support. Um, but, it, you know, it, there is no perfect way to do it and there are gonna be uncomfortable moments and there are gonna be gaps and mistakes that you can continue to build on, but, you know, if you don't educate yourself to give yourself a background, if you don't take that leap and get uncomfortable, we'll never have these discussions. And, you know, because of COVID, because of the 24 hour news cycle and social media, the world is at a moment right now where our attention is on something that is making us uncomfortable. And that's what's really driving the conversations. I've never seen people engage and listen like they are right now. And it, it's uncomfortable, but on the other side of that, discomfort will be a lot of growth. Yeah, I totally agree. Uh, I actually took the question from a different perspective. I thought it might have been asking, how do you start these questions to, to get, the, get the new culture into your organization? And if that's uh, where the question was coming from, I would say, like Nick said, kind of understand the facts. You know, we're going to provide some, some reading materials afterwards and some suggestions. Talk to your community. Uh, you know, ask us questions if, you, if you'd like. And if, as long as you know the facts, like that, you know, the McKinsey studies, the BCG studies, the studies from people who have done it before, you can go just like with any business project or, or proposal, you can go in understanding all that information, provide, provide that information and say, hey, this is why this is helpful, not only for just like me, myself, my fellow employees, but this is why it's helpful for the business, you know, at, at commerce, fourth C Nick talked about and 
in his presentation. Yep, yeah, I agree. And I think even with our allies, I think sometimes there's a lot of fear. Um, what I've heard from some of the allies in my organization is they're afraid they're going to say the wrong thing. So, so there's a lot of folks now who are just so afraid and we see it because people issue a wrong statement or the wrong words and it's all over the news and they now they have the answer to it. So I think the, the education point that um, Nick brought up is really key and providing folks with the resources so they can get educated and also having some compassion for them as well because they really don't know and some of them are trying and, and, and they're going to say things sometimes that don't necessarily come out the way that they intended. And so I think just having compassion and empathy all the way around during this time is, is really um, important and what's needed. Um, so I think we've gotten through all of our questions this morning. So again, I just want to thank everybody, the participants, the sponsors, um, everyone who made this event possible. It's really been a fantastic morning. Uh, my hope is that everyone on the call takes away what you've heard today and goes back, goes back to your organizations and really just continue this conversation. Don't let it die with the end of, of this webinar this morning. So with that, I'm going to hand it back to John to close us out. You guys are the best. Um, while I have, uh, we have 158 people still on the line and I'll tell you, one of my favorite CPAs uh, just pledged $5,000. I, I mean, that's just love. It's just this, this event has been real. It's been sincere. I love the, the themes of empathy and honestly how to do this and from a real perspective what our speakers went through i can i can honestly tell you from knowing ken now for five years for knowing nick throughout the years um i met jamila because i emailed jamila to ask her just if i could sit down for a cup of coffee with her we met at warner's after that probably a year later she joined the board for boys and girls club and honestly he's been a perfect fit for our finance committee um i'm, I'm gonna tell you also real quick and i i, I don't want to take too much time but I was, um, I wanted to see something tangible that I could help. So when I went to the Gilmore Homes Club back four or five years ago uh, and met the kids is when I realized the mission for Boys and Girls Club was something special. It's transferable. We could put a club every mile in Baltimore City, give kids opportunity to be safe, to be nurtured, to be given nutrition. It is honestly a transferable and effective way with the backing now of the Boys and Girls Club of America to legitimize it, to have the financial controls, to have the leadership, to make something special happen in Baltimore City, and then as well as to expand throughout Howard County and Baltimore County, hopefully one day. Um, I'll tell you, when you meet the kids in the clubs, it recognizes how special, um, I'm sorry, how effective our club systems are. And I'll tell you, sit down with Ken, and ask him about what he's, again, what he's, what he's gone through and, and what he's seen in those clubs. I distinctly remember just sitting down with those kids and thinking to myself, these are wonderful little kids who are put in probably areas that are just not as supported. And um, I think we can do something special. So I, I challenged through chat, we had 174 people at the time, we have 154 people. Let's make something special happen. Maybe we can raise a, a good amount of money, um, but I hope this was effective and, and, and helped you. Please join FEI if you think it's valuable. This is CPE credits. It's going to go to help you professionally. The next event will be in July. I mean, I'm sorry. Yeah, July. Uh, I believe July 10th, we're going to do a leadership uh, networking conversation through, I believe, uh, my friend Keith Dahl. Um, I'm going to be sending that out as well as just the opportunity to make a donation. But Kim, thank you so much for moderating. Thank all the, I thank all the guests for taking their time in the morning. And the speakers, Ron Stott's going to be giving you a small gift. Angela Bray put together a gift package. And Kim, Kim I think you'll be getting something too. Um, but we love you guys. And honestly, um, thank you so much for making this morning special. And, um, you know, I, I honestly ask me about this. Let's continue the conversation. And what a productive way to spend an hour and a half this morning. So thank you, everybody. And have a great weekend. And please keep, keep the conversation going. And, and feel free to ask us. Take care. Thanks, everybody.